James Corden is the root of all digital marketing horrors. If your conversion rate is low, it's James Corden's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Dojo A Marketing News Podcast by Exposure Ninja. This week, you're going to be talking about Perplexity AI releasing an ad tool that you can use to capture some of that lovely search traffic. We're also going to be talking about how many links you should include in your content for SEO and whether one or two or five or 50 is too many or too few. Who knows? Someone at Google is counting, but are they counting by hand? I guess you'll just have to listen to this week's episode to find out. Let's get into it. On to the stories for this week. So Tim, what have you got lined up for us? Uh, I have perplexities plans to start running some ads. Jess, what do you got? Oh, my story today is about how many outbound links should you be including in your content? Oh, that's a question I ask myself all the time as I layer up the links, link upon link upon link. Is that one too many? I don't know. Let's find out when we get to Jesse's story in just a second. But Tim, here's first. Perplexity, tell us everything. Yeah, so for those who don't know Perplexity, it's a sort of an AI-powered search engine, a little bit like Google's AI overviews or uh, ChatGPT, I guess. You ask it a question it goes and does a bit of a background web search and then pieces together an answer for you through a combination of its large language model but it also adds little links um, and uh, cites its sources which makes it quite useful and i think a lot of people really like perplexity um, and there was some news uh, that came out this week about perplexity's plans that open up some advertising and perplexity is taking this deck to potential advertisers to drum up a bit of interest uh, before they start doing this apparently in q4 this year so q4 2024 now there's some interesting stuff here and i got a bit excited um with this news and picking it apart because i think there's a couple of things which are curiosities to those of us that are search geeks um so firstly in this deck there was some data about perplexity's popularity and how much it's growing so us queries rose eightfold in the past year so that's pretty big right um however Perplexity is still only serving uh, 230 million queries a month. I mean, that's a lot of queries, but only. <laughs> only. Just to put it in context, that their monthly search query volume, Google does every 40 minutes. So they can oh. keep growing eightfold and it's going to take a, a little while. Um, I think the most interesting takeaway from this whole ad leak thing is the fact that Perplexity isn't opting for a cost per click. Um, basis to, to sell their ads. They're opting for a, a CPM, a cost per thousand impressions model, which is very typical in the world of display advertising. But in search, we marketers are used to spending money per click on Google or Bing for every visitor that we get through to our website. So I think there's some really sort of interesting implications to that decision, which I'd love to unpack if we're interested. But the formats sound also slightly different to what we're used to seeing in search. So uh, talking about showing a video at the top of the answer, this would be a sponsored video. So pretty display ad-y format. Um, also showing um, display ads to the right of the answer as well, uh, presumably on desktop. And then being brands being able to sponsor related questions. So one of the examples I saw or heard about was somebody searches one of the best basketball shoes. And then there's a you know, a related question, which is, you know, best Nike basketball shoes. And then the theory would be that Nike is able to control the answer or have some input on the answer that perplexity serves because the answers on perplexity are, they, they change, they're created each time. There would also be some a continuity with those sponsored answers as well. So there'd be a bit of control over what it actually showed. You know, if you search for what are the best Nike basketball shoes as a sponsored search, and it was like, yeah, Nike doesn't really have any good basketball shoes. Obviously, that's a terrible advertiser experience. So presumably, they'd be allowed some sort of editorial control over how those ads are shown. So yeah, this could be pretty interesting. They've got a pretty punchy cost that they're projecting for this. So they're thinking of charging $50 a CPM. So that's about five to 20 times the going rate. So Whoa. pretty expensive. But if the traffic is super targeted, which it should be on search, and perplexity's audience tends to skew sort of higher income, at the moment, at least, then perhaps that could be worthwhile. Um, 
There's also a bit of a publisher rev share that they've been announcing as well. So if as a publisher, your website gets cited as a source, you will get a percentage of the ad revenue generated by that query. Okay, so that might be one reason why this CPM has to be pretty high, because every time you make a search and there's ads, well, Perplexity is going to share some of that revenue with the websites that are listed as sources. Um, what, what sort of revenue that turns into for the for the websites, we have no idea yet. But just the fact that they've got something along those lines, I think is going to make them a bit more attractive to publishers and some of these other tools. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the sort of the news without too many takes on it. What are we thinking, people? Like, is this going to be a big advertising channel in the future, do we think? I think it could be. I'm definitely wondering like who the audience is right now, because I would say the everyday person probably isn't using perplexity to find like, for, for example, your example was the trainers. I would say the everyday person probably isn't using that. But maybe if you knew that you had an audience, like if you're selling like one of those AI pins, potentially you could have a bit more of like success in that space. Mm. Or if you're selling something that's like very new tech, that has that early adopter vibe. I think this could be a really great space space for you. But I also think it's going to pave the way for other more mainstream AIs to take the same approach, which is why I'm interested in this. I'm not necessarily sure that this is going to be a, you must act on this right now for most people listening. But I do think it's worth keeping an eye on because I think we're going to end up with this coming through to like the more mainstream AIs, whether that's Google, whether that's ChatGPT. I think you've hit a really important point there in terms of there are lots of these different uh, versions and skins for LLMs for these large language model language models, and uh, maybe some of them are going to borrow from what they what appears on the surface to be working for some of these. But generally, the lesson to take is you need to be working to figure out how to get your brand and your content featured across any of these. Like you need to do optimization for AI SEO essentially, like okay, this advertising is coming, therefore that these platforms must be, you know, advantageous from a profitability point of view. Like if they're going to add on ads there, it means that there's enough traffic. Therefore, how on earth do I get myself featured in them? And that's why you've got uh, software like HubSpot coming out with their new AI search grader, which checks to see how often your website or business is mentioned in these. So yeah, the main lesson here, I've said lesson here like three times, it clearly matters to me. You need to go ahead and start working on optimizing your website and your content to appear in chatbots like ChatGPT and SearchGPT and whatever else that comes down the line, uh, down mm. the road. On the topic of traffic there, Daryl, you mentioned traffic and I thought it was a really curious decision, an interesting decision for Perplexity to choose CPM rather than CPC, given that CPC is the default approach for search. And I wonder if it actually implies a lack of confidence on Perplexity's part. This might be reading too much into it, but hear me out. I think if Perplexity was confident that they could generate a lot of clicks for advertisers, it would make more sense to go on a CPC basis because then they'd be being rewarded for the thing that they're actually delivering. And that was generally more appealing to advertisers who want to pay for clicks rather than just impressions, which may or may not work. So I wonder if Perplexity isn't that confident or possibly more likely they've seen the data from click-through rates and they know that they're not driving a huge amount of traffic to the websites that they're linking to. And therefore, advertisers aren't going to be generating as much traffic as they would maybe from text search ads where you might get a sort of 5% click-through rate potentially. But this also led me on to think about the types of searches that Perplexity is used to serving. So Jess, your point about the basketball shoes. Yes, people probably aren't going on to Perplexity to search for basketball shoes at the moment. What Perplexity really excels in is um, sort of complex queries. So I asked it earlier about the implications of Donald Trump's proposed um, tax tariffs for UK exporters to the US. And that's not necessarily, I mean, Perplexity did a great job of answering that and gave me a really tailored answer. That's an incredibly informational query. There is no commercial intent there at all. And it makes me wonder if Perplexity has built a tool which is designed to serve 
the most informational and therefore least valuable search traffic of all. So perplexity is catering to the people who have no intention of buying when they do or when they are ready for something to buy and they want to find the best export tax law firm or export tax accountant, they'll just head over to Google and give Google a ton of money from their high commercial intent clicks. And if so, there could be implications there for all of us marketers who are trying to optimize for these AI chats in that we're maybe not going to get a huge amount of commercial tra traffic from them. I don't know. I know that's a, I've sort of extrapolated that a long way, but that was the concern seeing them use this model rather than CPCs. Yeah, I wonder if it's also related to like session data. So in my experience, personal experience, and this might not be everybody, but I tend to spend a lot longer within a chat session or prompt session or whatever you want to call it with whichever one I pick. I, I like to swap it around and try different ones and different tasks. And sometimes I end up spending like quite a long time in there versus a Google search where I'll just bang out my question, I get my result, a link through to the page. What if it is cost per meal because it is supposed to be People are going to spend the next 20 minutes in there. They're going to see a couple of the brand coming up a couple of different times during there as the chat develops. And that's why they're doing it by, that way. Like they realize the click is less likely to happen. Therefore, how do we make money from that, that top of funnel, the brand awareness kind of stuff? I think mm. you, you're right there. I think that maybe that's what they're seeing in the data. But I also think that they see maybe more long term how people are going to spend a lot longer doing the research across whichever tool it's in Google. And there are all these different touch points along the way, and they just need to be able to make money from those touch points. They know that the final commercial click is good. It could be anywhere. It could be direct to the website rather than via a chat or via search. And they're like, how do we just monetize all those touch points along the way? And maybe that's why they see the, the relevancy of CPM versus CPC. Yeah, I guess my thoughts on it, based on what you've both have just said is yes there's definitely a lot of like top level queries happening but if we go all the way back to the basketball shoe example again if i'm going to an, an ai and saying like what's the best or like what should i be looking for when i'm buying trainers you know whether that's like tutorials on how to measure your foot you know when you step on a piece of paper and it shows you Anyway, I'm not explaining. I'd, I've never done this before, so I'm not explaining it very well. But you know, all the things, if you've got wide feet, if you've got high arches, um, all the different <laughs> things. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, but I think all the different things. Like this past week is so complicated. I don't know why it's so hard to just measure some feet for some shoes. Like, <laughs> anyway, sorry. Well, this is it. But it might, you know, then you might end up being like, okay, here's some recommendations. Would you like to click through to them? Which then I do see a click happening in that situation. But I wonder if the, like I said at the start, I wonder if the general public are ready for that or if they're just not thinking to use an AI in this way. But like I think about what we do in, in the house and we'll be like, oh, okay, or my housemate will be like, right, I've got this product, this product, this product in terms of like food. What can I make with this? That I guess there's an opportunity to be like, you know, this recipe was from this recipe book, but then that's just this. I just feel like it's not possible. Mm. It's so like, yeah, it's it's a hard one to answer. And I think a lot of the advice here is is going to just be wait and see. <laughs> we kind of yeah. just need to see how it plays out. I think a lot of us thought that like Google AI was going to be totally different to what it is. And then it's rolled out and it's kind of like, okay, it's here. All right. You know, it's not really as, as big as I felt like it potentially could have been with the way that they were kind of mm -hmm. teasing it. Um, and I do wonder if that's part of the reason why Perplexity is going for the CPM model, just because they're like, well, we don't want to be trying to guarantee clicks or or acting like we're going to be getting loads and loads of clicks for these clients. If we go for the CPM, which feels a little bit more, a little bit safer, then mm. maybe they can kind of, maybe they're testing the waters themselves. Like I think everybody's a bit like, is this going to be a big testing phase for a lot of people, whether that's brands that are just like, okay, like you mentioned Nike, maybe they're going to be like, let's just try it, see what happens. Maybe we'll get some impressions. Maybe we'll get none and we'll just see how it goes. Um, yeah, I'm kind of waffling here because I can't really articulate all my big no, thoughts about AI. <laughs> I don't think that's waffle at all. I think you hit a really important point about the kind of brands that are going to give this a go are the ones that have like a budget set aside to 
to pay you know to have a play with this to see the potential like i was talking with uh john our uh, uh, director of sales this week and was talking about the kind of brands that he's familiar with they do set aside like a bucket of money to just be like this is the thing i want to play with this year and if it doesn't work out that's fine if we're going to try out the metaverse it doesn't work fine no worries we're going to build this thing in Ro- roblox we're going to build this thing in minecraft it doesn't go anywhere okay fine but that's what that bucket of money is for. There will be some businesses who are willing to put the bucket towards what Perplexity are trying to pitch and sell right now. And it'll be really interesting to see that, how that works out. But if I'm thinking as a, a marketing manager or a director, my, team, my question to you, Tim, would be, should I be thinking about this in my SEO plans for 2025 or my content plans for 2025? I think absolutely optimizing for... Optimizing for AI is a really, really important thing to start doing right now. And we've got videos and all sorts of stuff on exactly how to do that and some of the techniques that you need to use. Spoiler alert, it's essentially doing basic SEO because all of these AI search tools are running some sort of web search in the background. But then it's also about specifically optimizing the content on the page to make it digestible for these to these chatbots and making sure that you're um, backing up the answers that they're given. So I absolutely think that is a really important thing. And any piece of content that we're producing, we should be optimizing for those. I think it's not going to be one on the to-do list for the advertising side of things yet, because it seems like AI chat advertising models are just not here yet, really. Honestly, they're still testing this stuff. And they've gone with the most basic and least performance based ad model ever. So yeah, the jury's out on when you're going to be actually putting this in your paid ads plan for the next year, I think. Just on that point of optimizing your content for SEO, it brings me to your story about links and how many links to put in your content. Perhaps you'd like to start us off on your story. So I came across this article um, from search engine journal, all about how um, this conversation that happened Mm -hmm. about outbound links and SEO and the the headline was kind of Google debunks outbound links for SEO right basically saying Google has said that outbound links do nothing and I can understand why this assumption was made a little bit but this is kind of one of those where it's like you're taking things a little bit face value so admittedly my headline was a little bit clickbait apologies Um, but basically a discussion happened in the SEO community recently about like how many outbound links you should include on a page or in a blog or any content so that's links that go to somewhere that isn't your website and it's long been believed that you know linking to other websites is good because it you know kind of shares the love shows you're a nice person but also it can be really helpful to your audience if you're trying to explain something or you're referring to something you don't really want to explain in that content but you can link to or if you're talking about a tool or a product that you want to link out to that's when you would use outbound links and basically somebody asked um the search liaison john Mueller. for those who don't know basically he works for google but he's kind of like the human the human on earth, I guess, compared to like, he, he's kind of like the translator, right? Um, Chief, but somebody propaganda, said, Chief propaganda officer, I think. <laughs> Excellent. I was like, this is kind of funny because I was like, I feel like I need to caveat with some of the conversations we've been having recently about how much we should trust about what Google is saying, but also this this one, I feel like we can, we can take it. But somebody said, I have a question. It's common practice around SEOs to believe that adding a total of two to five in turn two to five internal links and around one to three external links in a 1000 word blog post is beneficial. Um, They also think that adding more links could be harmful to their site while adding fewer links might not provide much value. Could you please clarify whether the quantity of links really matters? So yeah, that's, that's basically how it is. Does it matter if you're linking out from your website? Is it, will you get penalized if you link too much? Will you not get enough value? You'd not be giving enough value if you don't link enough um and the response from john Mueller was nobody at google counts the links or the words on your blog post and even if they did i'd still recommend writing for your audience i don't know your audience but i have yet to run across anyone who counts the words before reading a piece of content um and the quote kind of got taken at face value in sort of like oh google says that you don't have to do any outbound links ever and this is a total lie and it doesn't impact seo but the way that I take it, and this is something that I push all the time when we're talking about SEO and content marketing, which is don't worry about the numbers so much. 
like try not to get bogged down in like oh i need to be linking out to three different people do you do you need to link out to three people or do you only need to link to one website or do you need to link to a bunch more because you're talking about a super complicated like you know if you're doing like a medical thing and you're like look if you want to find out more and you have a medical mind go and read this article because this has all the detail and you might need to do that two or three times or well what I'm trying to say is you might need to do that 10 times in your article if it's really complicated or you might not need to link out at all um so yeah just make useful content is really what what I say I feel like I say this on the podcast every week but if you are worrying about how many outbound links you need to be including or internal links don't worry about that. Just worry about creating good content that your audience will enjoy and that they're actually searching for and that they will actually want to read and then include as many outbound or inbound or internal links as you feel is appropriate. <laughs> That's yeah. it. Tim, yeah. Dale, <laughs> any thoughts on my rant? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I immediately thought that um, the phrase that I see on TikTok and places like that, like make it make sense. Like you want your content to just make sense to people. Like have it, you know, easy to read or as long as if it's a complicated subject, make it long. And if it requires like off links to go and dig deeper into the subject matter, then fair enough. But if it's only needs to be 300 words, then or 200 words or 100 words and just make it that long. I see why people do obsess a little bit about like word length and links and stuff. Because that's what the SEO community has been banging on about for years. So if I'm coming into it and I've, I don't know SEO because it's not the thing I do every day, I'm probably going to just listen to what people who do do it every day say. And if they're all saying the same thing, they go, cool, every blog should be 500 words. The first link in the thing is the most important one, blah, blah, blah. Whereas if you just look, and, and then of course you've got to add on to that. I'm looking at the rankings and comparing myself to competitors. And then they're like, okay, well, the first three positions have a minimum word count of 10,000 words and blah, blah, blah. It's really easy to get obsessed with that stuff. And just, you're trying to just adjust every dial that you can, like every little thing. Okay, well, I'll tweak this, I'll tweak this. Whereas the better play might just be to create a new piece of content that just fits the buyer journey better rather than just trying to do all this stuff. So, it really depends on the growth of your business. Like if you are already doing really, really well in terms of ranking, then you start to do the tweaking of like an extra link here, an extra internal link here, an extra 200 words here, that will help move it a little bit higher. But for many businesses, it's just a, better to just have the right content in the right places, cover the fundamentals, you know? Yeah, I, I completely agree with all this advice. Um, I think... John's I mean, been... AI, sorry, Tim, I hate to interject. Yeah. But the AI overview work that you've been doing for more than a year, 18 months now, isn't it? Yeah. It's come down to like keeping things simple and you know, getting to the point, all this kind of stuff. You don't have to overdo it. And the successes are there. The amount of screenshots I have of clients being featured in AI overviews, just as an example, I can't keep on top of. I just get too many now. And it comes back to what you were doing. Simplicity it just seems to work. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I do agree. I mean, and I think I, I completely agree with all the sort of practical advice. I think this is another example of Google misinformation, though, if I'm honest. If I'm going to play devil's advocate here, John said nobody at Google counts the links. Yeah, he's right. Nobody at Google. There's not one person at Google that's sitting there counting links on your website. But the original, Larry Page's original Stanford PageRank paper specifies that the number of links on a page does have an impact, right? So the page rank of a page, so every page on the internet is born with page rank and the amount of page rank that flows to each of the links pages, the links pages is defined by the page rank of the linking page divided by the number of outbound links on that page. So it, the number of links on a page is detailed in page rank which is still you we know from the algorithm leak we know is still used by google so whilst practically speaking absolutely we need to make our choices based on this stuff like this answer is i think it's just missing it's more garbage misinformation and this is classic google they'll pick on a really let's be honest this question is stupid right this person's asking is there like a specific formula for number of links on the page it's a low ball. You smash it over the fence. Like it's it's really easy to answer this question, but the answer is more misinformation. Like yes, outbound link numbers do matter if you're one of the pages that's being linked to. 
So just say, just write for the audience. Don't say that no one's counting links because they are. I just think this is, yeah, it's starting to annoy me how Google's it's a little bit play with the truth like this. It's a little bit sassy for like, I, I kind of understand it because I'm sure that these questions get asked every single day where it's like, should I be including X, Y, and Z in my content? It's like, well, would, is your audience care about X, Y, and Z? Then if so, yes. If not, no. It's like a, you know, choose your own adventure book. But I think, yeah, it is, it is a very fluffy answer. And you could, like, they could have just said, no, links don't really matter. Or yes, they do matter, but there's not a definitive number for this, you know? It's, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Oh, Tim, he's bringing up receipts. He's bringing up receipts <laughs> to the podcast. So if you're if you're watching on the video, you'll be able it to is. see this. But if not, Tim, the original page rank paper from 1998 was it? Page three says number of links. Okay, oh, okay, God. that is Someone. from a long time ago, though. That I was going to say 1998. Avocado, right? Is it possible that PageRank is now, instead of being an 80% part of the algorithm, like Tim, you and I and the SEO team, we've revised the SEO, uh, how to get to the top of Google book multiple times. Is it possible, plausible that PageRank as a percentage is closer to 20%, 10%, 5% now that the algorithm is probably mostly Gemini based of scanning content, seeing if it's credible, does it match up with our understanding in the LLM, blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think John's statement, nobody at Google counts the links or the words on your blog post. I would be amazed if Google's algos don't count the number of words on a blog post. And they definitely count the links. So whether it's a 5% weighting or a 0.5%, it's just a lie. It's just a straight up lie. I don't know. <laughs> I love bringing a story like this that really divides divides the room. I think that I've had a plan here. So <laughs> The vision here. I think we do uh, for the most part we agree on this. Like, oh, we we agree on the the practical like next steps. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. But it's just the way that Google is putting it to us is, mm, eh. I mean, yeah, <laughs> we've seen it all before from them. You, you don't entirely trust what they say is the recommendation I would make. The best thing to do is just do the SEO work yourself or work with an agency like Exposure Ninja who do it on a daily basis for hundreds of clients. We've got the receipts ourselves and we see what works and what doesn't, as you can see from all of our clients being featured in the overviews. And if that's something you want for your website, go to ExposureNinja.com forward slash review. You request a free website marketing review and we'll have a little look and see all of the opportunities for growth we can find for your website and business. Ping that over to you in a video form. You can watch that back and see how many of those opportunities you want to implement yourself or you can speak to us and we'll help you get them sorted. Yes. Not, actually, not everyone is eligible. eligible for that review though. We've got to remind people, not everyone, you do need to apply for it. Not everyone has accepted. No offense if you're not. I, I applied for the Goldman Sachs small business program and they rejected me. So we can overcome the rejection if you do get rejected. We'll certainly help you if we can. Yeah. Uh, okay. There's not enough time for my story. So I guess I'm going to carry that one over for next week. So do come back next week and hear about how we helped one of our clients to get a 363% increase in leads using AI within Google's ad platform. So that's one to definitely not miss. So I want to take the best story from this and turn it into uh, tasks for you. I'm just going to start with you first, but I haven't picked a story. So let's pick a story. <laughs> hmm. I'm going to say, personally, I think perplexity is the winning story. Jess, Tim. Yeah, I mean, the perplexity one isn't very actionable. So as for actions and things that you can do, I think you just got to keep watching for when these ads come out and keep an eye on it. Um, yeah. I, I, don't know I, I, that, I don't know what else people can actually do with it. Yeah, so I already want to be like doing the planning today to do the tasks today to get ready for next year. But fair point. In that case... How many outbound links should you be including in your content will be our story for today. Jess, from a specialist point of view, what would you be recommending to marketing managers to do? What tasks would you set them for that story? Yeah, I think based on everything we've said today, I can imagine people are like, it, should you be including a certain number of links? Should you not? Think about the user experience. If you include, if you find that a lot of your blogs are including so many links because you're trying to get all your affiliates in there or just because you're trying to hit like 
maybe you think more links is better, outbound links is better, then maybe you need to take a look and be like, oh my gosh, every other line has a link in it. This is just going to feel like I read a blog the other day where every other paragraph was recommending some other tool. And I was like, how many, do you want me to use 10 tools to do this? Like, are you kidding? Um, but the same goes for if you are not linking because you, you're, you're holding it all to yourself. Um, this can be useful as well. Last thing I want to say on that is if you're getting like decision paralysis or just can't just get on with content because you just feel like there's so many rules and you just don't know what's right and what's wrong like just don't worry about it just write for what your audience wants to hear about and if you want to link link if you don't don't and just test it if you include 10 links in one blog and five in another or zero in another which performed better it might have something to do with it it might not have anything to do with it. It's as SEO tends to go, there's a billion things that, that seem to impact that. So yeah, don't get too hung up on it. Test things out and um, don't panic, basically. And don't trust your... <laughs> no, that's not my advice. I, I don't think there's any business owner advice for this because honestly, I don't think business owners should be thinking about the number of outbound links per blog unless they're at the very early stages and they're also acting in the marketing manager capacity. Um, I would just add on like how you think about content. You just want to make content that looks like amazing content. And normally the best articles online do have outbound links. They cite their sources. They link to original related topics. So given that Google's algorithm is about trying to award stuff that looks like the best stuff, you want to do that, like Jess said. Um, but yeah, don't don't become obsessed with it. And I think this has the danger of becoming one of those things like, what's the perfect article length? Or is this, uh, you know, is this duplicate content where people get paranoid and fixated on it? Like just, there's more important things in the world. So just chill. It's okay. Chill and trust your SEOs. Uh, just listen to what they have to say. At the end of the day, if you're not sure, just ask them. They'll tell you. Um, come and speak to us. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for joining this week for another episode of the Dojo Podcast. If you want to reach out to us and have questions or something you'd like to talk about in the future, email us podcast at ExposureNinja.com. And if you love the Dojo and love the Exposure Ninja podcast that you listen to via Audio Fiends and via YouTube, leave us a review. It would be great to know what you think of our podcasts. And uh, Join us next week for some more. Take care, everyone, and bye.